You are now the opening night film, the opening night movie for the Seattle National Film Festival. Now you've you've premiered films at Cannes Film Festival, at Sundance, Toronto, very prestigious films. But what's it like for you to have the opening night film for basically your hometown film festival? Yeah, it's really huge. I've been going to SIF for my whole life and never imagined that I could have a film in the festival, much less <laughs> open the festival. Yeah. And there's just something, I mean, it's interesting because Hump Day, as you said, went to Cannes and I went to Sundance, but I was more nervous at the screening um, at SIF than I was at either of those. And <laughs> Is that right? I was like, why am I so, what's going on? And I think it's because I have to face these people, you know, the next day on the street. What if they don't like it? Um, yeah, there's something about being, uh, it, the, the hometown thing is just, I don't know, there's something for me that really gets me every time I just get choked up. <laughs> so tonight is insanely exciting for yeah, me. Well, yeah, that's, that, that's really, it's nice to hear. So you haven't gotten a big head yet. You don't think you're too big for Seattle? Well, you, you just mentioned that I'm on the cover of the City Arts magazine. I never really even noticed how much that magazine is everywhere oh. until my face appeared on it and now I just it's mortifying I mean I just go from I just oh oh every time I see it I'm just like want to hide and yeah it's funny I'm no I, I hope I hope I don't have a big head it's, well yeah your image is definitely ubiquitous right now in this town yeah. and it's a it's a nice Bye. shot of you so well, thank you. listen I want I I love this movie your sister's sister is what we're talking about so I wanted to do you consider this like a romantic comedy? How would you explain or pitch this film to somebody who doesn't know anything about it? Genre-wise, I call it a straight-up dramatic comedy. Ah, okay. Um, it's because I feel like there's drama and there's comedy, but the comedy Definitely. also comes out of the drama. It's almost like they're intertwined. They're like, you know, two sides of the same coin or something. Sure. As opposed to setting up pratfalls and jokey jokes and, you know... It's not that kind of comedy. It's yeah. more like character-based and relationship-based. You're laughing because it's true. You're laughing because you recognize these people on the screen <laughs> as being the flawed, you know, human beings that we all, you know, are and yeah. live among. Um, and uh, and yeah, it's not really a romantic comedy. It's sort of a comedy of errors, maybe of secrets and lies, uh, all kinds of relationships, sibling relationships, and friendships, and. Um, yeah, and I never like to give away too much about the plot because I feel like that's really where the delight comes from. Exactly. Now, and I'm comfortable uh, leaving it there. What I did want to ask you, and I think this doesn't give too much away, your last couple of movies have been about men dealing with men, the kind of relationships, bromances, uh, you know, at, at some points. This time out, it's really, although there is a man involved, there's a kind of triangle of sorts, but it's really about two women and specifically two sisters and, and their relationship. So I wanted to ask you, do you notice differences? You were fascinated. The last couple of times I've talked to you, you're fascinated by how men relate to men. You just thought that's such a, such a bizarre kind of uh, situation. Do you think that men relate to men differently than women relate to women? And if so, how so? Well, I mean, I don't like to, you know, paint with too broad a stroke, you know, but I do think that there are certain scenarios in which, I mean, what I'm really ultimately fascinated by is, the, is when people, the way that people try to connect. Everybody wants to connect, yeah. right? And what's most sort of heartbreaking and poignant and bittersweet and fascinating to me is when people desperately want to and they can't for, for a variety of reasons. Uh -huh. And so with heterosexual men, it's, you know, they're, they may have a deep love, platonic love for each other, but it's going to be, there's, there's going to be all kinds of sort of social strictures and, you know, internal taboos that are internalized taboos that are going to keep them from doing sure. it. Um, and with sisters, what I've noticed, I actually have an incredibly boring relationship with my sister. Very <laughs> pure, just total unadulterated love. Um, very uncinematic. It's very uncinematic. <laughs> but I have I have seen it at close hand um, friends who have had these really fascinatingly rich, you know, relationships with their sisters where there's this deep bonding and clear desire to just, you know, sort of really you know, really bond, mm -hmm. but there's just all kinds of history and baggage and layers of old resentments that keep coming up and they, they push each other's buttons more than anybody else in the world can. And, you know, and I, I've just been so fascinated as an observer, you know, as an outside observer. And so it's a similar, it, those kinds of matchups where people, you know, uh, for whatever reason, there's just some, so it's, it's less yeah. of a male female thing for me than yeah. you know, I think it's sort of an individual you know, relationship yeah. scenario. So could you Im imagine having made your brother's brother? Oh, sure. Oh, oh. absolutely. Yeah, oh, no, wow. I've seen really 
amazing relationships between brothers as well. And I feel like there's actually two sets of siblings in this film because there's a um, the the guy Jack played by Mark Duplass has lost his oh, brother. Oh, you're right. And so it's almost like he, he you know he's not talked about a ton, but yeah. but Tom the the dead brother weighs so heavily in haunts you know Jack that um, and and he ends up informing how he relates to the other characters, the two sisters yeah. in the film. That I feel like he's that unseen fourth fourth character. Yeah, that makes perfect sense to me. Uh, you've now made four films. I, you actually just finished filming, I understand, your, your fifth film. So can we, can you maybe describe what you think would define a Lynn Shelton film? Do you think that you've come to a certain, you know, stance in your career that you actually now can recognize? This is me, this is my kind of film, and this isn't me, or this isn't my kind of film? Um, you know... That, it's hard for me to say that now because of the film that I just shot called Touchy Feely. Um, my fifth is is so different than the last three. Oh. It's really different. It's got multiple storylines. I mean, I made three films in a row that basically have three characters and they all take place in essentially one location over the course of mostly like a three-day weekend. Um, yeah. And I wanted to break out of that. And so my last film is uh, that I just shot and haven't edited yet is uh, is very, you know, multiple storylines, multiple characters, lots of locations. Um, it's there's hardly I don't think there's anything handheld in the whole thing except maybe one little scene. Um, it's all on tripod, so it it has a very different vibe than the other films. But something tells me it'll still feel like a film from me. You yeah. Know? Um, and I, it's hard for me to articulate what that might be. But I mean, it's mostly interpersonal, you know, interpersonal relationships, and also the relationship that one has with oneself. That's kind of the ultimate fascination I have is that we have these um, images of ourselves, you know, that often don't match up with the reality of who we actually are. <laughs> and also we go through and we're different, we're different when we're with different people and, you know, there's just yeah. all these masks. And so that's kind of an, the ultimate fascination. Yeah. So th the thing that's fascinating about, and I don't, I have no idea if it, it creates the end result in a, in a more distinctive way. But the, your process of making movies reminds me a bit of, and it may be really, from an outsider's point of view, it reminds me of the way Mike Lee makes movies. That he gets these great actors together and they kind of improvise before there's a script. They come up, I think he ends up generating a script, but it's like it comes from, from within, or within the, the cast. Tell us about your process of making movies. Well, it's similar to Mike Lee in that um, we both are extremely collaborative with the actors and draw on the actors' um, with improvisation, but he, as you said, he actually, after a period of uh, workshopping with the actors for a number of months, he actually has a script at the end of it, yeah. and then he goes and makes the movie in a very traditional way, where they know what the lines are, and they shoot it the way, you know. So um, you're basically one-upping Mike Lee, is that what you're <laughs> telling me? <laughs> <laughs> Not exactly, I would never go that far. Um, I just have a slightly, my twist, I guess, is that I... Uh, I like to improv, and I'm not the only one doing this, the Duplass brothers do it as well, sure. among many others, but um, uh, I have a structure, when I get to set, I know exactly what's going to happen in every scene, so it's not that I'm improvising the structure of the film on set, um, I really want to know how the journey, what the journey is going to be, that the mm -hmm. audience is going to be taken on, um, uh, and I've developed that structure in tandem with the actors, mostly I'm drawing on them for information about who those characters are and asking them to help participate in creating backstory for the relationships and and for each character over the course of several months. So with your sister's sister, it was like eight months. I mean, I would get on the phone with them just every few weeks. It wasn't like we were together for okay. eight months. Um, and I would go and work on the treatment and then come back and we'd talk more and, you know, have this little character Bible. and, and and then by the time we get to set, we're all on the same page about who these people are. That's really important for the improvisation because if you don't know who you are and you don't know what the scenario is, it's really difficult to ask you to just sort of come up with some words, sure. right? Yeah. Um, and then the improvisation is on set. So we don't have any rehearsals because you basically want to be shooting the rehearsals. You know, oftentimes with improv, the very best take will be that first one. Wow. Um, there might be a surprise. There's a moment when Emily Blunt actually blushes for real on screen because <laughs> Rose surprises her with something that she was not expecting. <laughs> and uh, and Emily has often said, I've never experienced that before on, <laughs> on set. And I don't think I, you know, I, you you can't manufacture that, yeah. you know, and that's the beauty of improv. So what I'm doing is trying to find naturalism, and authenticity, and credibility in the in. I'm use that's why you, I use improv just with the dialogue, 
um, and the words. Spoken. So I would guess, Christopher Guest talks about there are certain people that can do his kind of improvisational comedy, and other actors, they're great actors, but they can't do it. You must, there must be a, a very select group of people that are willing to play with you, right? Or, or do you think most actors think they can do that, and can they? Um, I think that, I think it's a combination. I think some people um, are, they really want to, and then it turns out they can't. Um, but I feel like everybody really can to a certain degree. Uh, you know, it was very interesting. I, Hump Day was two really great veteran improvisers. Both mm. Joshua Leonard and, and Mark Duplass are, are really great. I mean, it was a 10-page outline. There was no dialogue written because wow. they didn't need it. They didn't want it. Um, with with your sister, sister, it was a 70-page scriptment, I called it, because it was a little bit of treatment, but mostly it, it was actually, many of the scenes were actually written out. But uh. they were never meant to be held tightly. You know, I said just... I think Emily said she would sort of look at it the night before or, or the day of and not memorize the lines and just get a sense of the trajectory and the gist of the scene and then they would just go off. And then sometimes, I mean, with Mark, a, a lot of the scenes with Mark, he would just take them on some road that nobody was expecting and they would just have to be along, go along <laughs> for the ride, you know. Um, and then when the two, uh, because both Rosemary DeWitt and Emily were less, you know, very little experience with, with improv, so I didn't want them to feel like I was throwing them out there without a safety net, yeah. so that's why I had the dialogue written. But they would, they also would go off, you know, they would sort of, they worked with it in a different way, but but it was also, they also created their own sense of naturalism and, you know, would sort of come and go off the lines and, and as they got more comfortable would sort of glide off more and more.